Good morning. Let me say good morning before it is 12. One minute to 12, so it is morning. When we were asked to share, I did not share because I was feeling inadequate to preach today. So I did not share. So standing here, I am actually, I feel like I am not qualified. So I need God to be with me as I do this again. <clears throat> Last Sunday, it was Gideon, the Israelite and the Midianite. Today we continue with the same story. It is still Gideon, the man who said last week, I am from a very small clan. My background is very small and I cannot be used by God. But since God doesn't see things the way we see, God decided to use him. I remember saying last week that all the argument that he gave, the angel did not consider it. And only say, go in your strength and save the Israelite. They needed a savior. And the savior was feeling inadequate. But God actually pushed him to accept the call to go and serve. And like all of us, we normally feel like we are not okay to do God's work. But what God sees in you, you may not believe. Because in you, he sees someone different from what you yourself will see and from what others may see you. And many a times we feel like we are not qualified because of what others tell us about us. They will say, the way you look, it seems as if you can do nothing. I know your family background very well. No one good has ever come from your own line. And because of that, you feel like you are not qualified to do God's work. But I want to tell you that always look to God when there is an assignment for you to carry out. Don't look up to people. They will discourage you. Look up to God, and you will get strength to do it. And when you look up to God and he gives you the strength to do it, you will do it. And then you will be surprised at the result. So God is a miracle walking God. So today we want to look at chapter 7. And before we go into the text, I want to summarize the text for us so that we will flow with it. Chapter 7 tells us the story of Gideon again. A judge chosen by God to lead the Israelite against their oppressors. They are dealing with a force that is against them. And in this case, the Midianite. So Gideon was instructed by God to reduce the size of his army. How many were they? 32,000 men. For the battle. That is a good start. That is a good force to go to war with. But God asks him to reduce it and allow only a very small number to take to the battle. And so God instructed him 
to tell the people, those who are afraid, to go back. That was the instruction. If you are fearful, go back. And to his surprise, which was mine as well, 22,000 men left. 22,000 men left. When I was reading this, I just thought of something. I said, you know, when we were starting this project, if they could ask people, are we going to achieve it? Those who say we will, show up your hands. Maybe we will have gotten few people. Right? Because let me tell you the truth as we are here like this. There are people with a lot of fear inside them. And so they will always give some good argument to support their fear. 22,000 men back off. And so how many are left? 10,000 men are left. Now, we will think that this 10,000 is okay. God will actually go with these 10,000. But God also insists again and asks Gideon to reduce this number. He said this number is still too much for him to use. And asks him to take the people down to the water. He is going to test them by himself. And right there, he tested them. And then, 9,700 9, failed the test. And now, how many are left? Just 300. If you ask Gideon then, how many men do you have at this level? Like Moses, he will say, just 300 men. Who will believe that 300 men can go and win war against people that are described as locusts in abundance? Nobody will believe, right? But that is not God, the way God works. God's ways are not our ways. And the way he does his own things, our minds cannot even comprehend it. And that is what makes him God. So Gideon is going to go now with how many men? 300 men. That is the summary of what I think that portion of scripture is telling us. So, what are we talking about this morning? Defying all odds, Gideon's triumph and community trust. That is the topic for our sermon today. But the first thing that I want to talk about it is God's call to Gideon. You see this in chapter 7, verse 1 to 8. God calls this man Gideon. So this section began with the word of the Lord. To tell you again that the Lord is the main character of the story. At the end of the story, the narrator doesn't want you to see Gideon. He doesn't want you to see the Amalekite. He doesn't want you to see the Midianite. He doesn't want you to see those who will carry torches and jars. But he wants you to see God for who God is. So if you remove God of the story, you are a man with flesh and blood. And that will mean nothing. So the word of the Lord, the Lord said to Gideon. I always like to see how these connect because the Bible is just a one story. God is telling a redemptive story. And so when he says something here, it makes sure that that thing ties in line with something he has said before. 
when you hear the Lord said to Gideon, it is the same way he actually spoke to Abraham in chapter 12. And the Lord said to Abraham. And I like this statement because when you hear God say, the Lord said to somebody, two things will happen. The phrase that will come after this will either be an imperative or it will be a judgment when the Lord speaks like that. But in this case, it will be an imperative. So, it is the same way that he addressed Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 1. But so, this phrase is coming just to tell you that it is not Gideon's father speaking. It is not they are leaders, but it is the ultimate leader, God, that is speaking. So Gideon had prepared 32,000 men to take into this battle. But as a very respectable general who don't want to make errors, that was okay for him to get 32,000. He did not want to underestimate things. Humanly speaking, he was doing well to take those men to go to war with. But as a result, it is only okay in his own eyes, but it is not okay in the eyes of the Lord. And therefore, the Lord needs to change the battle and change the structure and change the men that he will use in this battle. So the Lord actually will ask him to do something different. 32,000. What is God doing? Well, let me ask it in another way. If God will ask him to reduce the number, what is at stake here? I believe that something is at stake here. And God is working so hard to avoid that. So what is that? The glory of the Lord is at stake. And so the reason why God is asking Gideon to reduce this army is just because if that happened with this number of armies, they will glorify in themselves instead of Glorifying in God. That is what God is afraid. And so, it is clear that he doesn't want to share his glory with anybody. If there is something that he will do and glory will come to man, he will not do it. He will not do it. And so your prayers every day should be, God use me. Not for me, but for you. Did you not hear Jesus pray that? Let it be your will, not my own will, because God's will, God's glory, and God's purpose is always the one that we should see. So the glory of the Lord was at stake. If he allowed them to go with this 32, they will boast in themselves. And also, they will say, our own strength saved us. You understand? And God doesn't want that at all. That is why when men say, let us gather together and build a tower that reach the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. God called the counsel that he had and then decided to step down and confuse them. Whenever man will begin to think in a way that will attract the glory to himself, God will do something to counter that. And so here, God is trying to avoid that. It is the same thing that God is telling them in Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 17. He says, beware, lest you say in your heart, my power, and strength, and the strength of my hand has gotten me wealth. 
beware when you begin to think it is me and me and me. Like the rich fool in the New Testament. He was like, I have done this. I have done this. Now I will sit. Now I will do this. And the Lord said, you are thinking more of yourself. It is like, I am not seen in the picture. Only you. Therefore, your life will be taken from you today. So whenever God discovers that something will happen and man will take the glory, he will make sure that that doesn't happen at all. So 32,000 men were brought. God reduced it to how many? 22,000 men. And therefore, God commanded Gideon to proclaim to the people, if you are afraid, go back. If you are trembling, go back. And these 22 went home. We have not heard anything about them again. They did not even put them as backup. Because what will they be backing up? They are good for nothing. I pray. We should not fall in this line. I really pray. Yeah, so when he reduced, I mean, when that number was reduced, God is still looking at that number and saying that it is too much. And so he asked Gideon to still reduce it again. And then he got 10,000 men, and they are still too much for the Lord to use. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too much. Take them down to the water, and I will test them by myself. And anyone to whom I say to you, this shall go with you, that shall go. And anyone that I say, this will not go with you, this one will not go with you. And that is how God got 300 men to go with. But what is this? What is 300? What will they do? Almost nothing. But what is God's point in this? Because the Midianite are like the locusts in abundance. That is what my translation say. And 300 men are going to fight them. So God is placing them at the level that they are very weak. Humanly speaking, they are weak. They cannot conquer them with this army. 3,000. So what is supposed to play here seriously? Faith and obedience is what will count here. Faith and obedience. And trust in the Lord is what is going to count here seriously. So that is what is happening in the picture now. But look at this. The battle plan is drawn. 300 men. God is okay with this. And Gideon is ready to go into this battle. You see this now in chapter 7, verse 9 to verse 18. And so God commanded him, Gideon, arise and go down against the calm. Have you ever heard this statement anywhere in scripture? Arise and go against the camp. Go down against the camp. I am thinking of Jonah. And the Lord said to Jonah, Arise and go to where? Nineveh. And Jonah feel like I am unable and he decided to take another way. Was he sleeping? I don't know. Was he sitting? I don't know. But that is a way of God saying, take courage and go down. And what is the reason? It gives us in the second phrase, for I have given 
it into your hands. See the way God speaks. Very logical. Arise, go. And the reason you should arise and go is because I have already given them into your own hands for you to conquer. How does this even tie with New Testament? Does it? In any way. Jesus said, all authority in heaven has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Why will the disciples go to make disciples? Because Jesus promised that he is going to be with them all through their discipling life. Right? And so, Gideon is going to take the army down and fight the enemies just because God has already given the armies of the Midianite into his own hands. So he is going with that. So, what will you say is now happening? Gideon now is going in the strength that God is going to supply. From the very beginning, he should understand that he is not going to fight. Someone is there fighting. Therefore, after the fight, no boosting. No boosting. Yeah, because there is no chance for you to do that. But he contrasts it by saying, but if you are afraid, because as human beings, there is that aspect of fear inside, right? You remember when God was asking Joshua to step in the position of Moses and lead these people, he keeps saying, have I not commanded you? Be strong and very courageous. When God repeats that, what do you think? He was not willing to go. He was refusing. And God is like, I am the one talking. Listen to me and go there and then win. But God said, if you are afraid to go down, go down with your servant. Pura. And then as you go down, you shall hear what they are saying. And after what? Your hand shall be strengthened to go down against them. Because when they reach down there, and as they are somewhere listening, they will say, they will share a dream. And the interpretation of that dream is that Gideon has conquered this battle. And they discuss it. And when Gideon heard that, he was actually strengthened and with the servant. And so he is now able to carry this man down into the battlefield to go and conquer this battle. It was because of that dream that God wanted him to go down and hear. And so he took the, this force, 300 and went down with them. What would they do in this matter, if not God? Is it not foolishness? Just like the Apostle Paul said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. If you look at this one too, 300 army is only foolishness to those who do not know God. But for those who know God, the strength lies in God, not in man. God is like Kenya power. Eh? When he gives power, we have it. When he stops it, we don't have it. Right? Because the light we use even here, the source is not here. It is somewhere else. If it goes off, then we just wait for them to give it back again. That is how our lives are connected with God. But it is wise to those who know their Lord. Because he has already assured them of the fact that he has given the Midianite into their own hands, as you see in verse 9. A command was given to the people by Gideon when he realized that God has given these people into his own hands and he gave the command first 
did not worship the Lord. And I would say here that the first weapon to win any spiritual battle is worship. Because even in the New Testament you hear as they were singing and praising their God, what happened? Chains were loose, doors were open, and people were released, right? You also read that in the Old Testament as well. Gideon worshipped the Lord. And after worship, what happened? He commanded the people the same way God commanded him, arise, let us go into the battle. You see, God command him, and then he command his people. I was talking with someone and I said, democracy, democracy should only be practiced in politics, not in church. Because one time they, that there was a democracy in the church, many things went wrong. Do you remember that story? When Moses went up to the mountain, he delayed there. The voice of the people, the government of the people, by the people, for the people, <laughs> came to Aaron and said, please, make us a God. The God that took us out of Egypt <laughs> to the promised land. What did Aaron do to them? Bring all the things, and if he comes to this church, maybe he will still get the same number because we have it on our ears, on our hands, and everywhere, right? Bring them. And I realize that that is why some people, in, I mean some religious doesn't wear chains. They don't put bangles and they don't do anything because those things can bring confusion in the church. <laughs> he asked them to bring them just because of democracy. And he said, when they brought those things, he mailed them and formed what? A God. And proclaim, this is your God. What was he responded to? The government of the people, by the people, for the people. Many things went wrong. But it seems as if God has always worked well with instructions for his followers to follow. And when he used a leader, he would always say, tell my people... Tell my people, don't negotiate with them. You understand? If Gideon start negotiating here, many things will also go wrong. But by the way, take for instance, what will have happened if Moses say, let's negotiate whether we will cross this Red Sea? They will have still been there, even right now as we speak, right? Because many voices will come up, many ideas, Many things. As we are here like this, if we are 100, uh, 200 here, that is 200 ideas. You understand? And let's say we want to go the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We will delay a lot. Arise and go. And so that happened. For the Lord has given them into our hands already. Then he divided the army into three, meaning... One one hundred, right? Yes, one one hundred. Again, they are being divided into three. One one hundred. And he put in their hands trumpet, maybe the same trumpet that they used to divide, uh, to bring down the walls of Jericho, and then with torches, and then with empty jars. But let me say that. The torches and the trumpet, these symbolize the presence of the Lord in their midst. No wonder why Jesus in the New Testament will say, I am the light of the world. You see the torches? They symbolize the presence of the Lord. So what is required here? The requirement here is not strategies. It's not weapons. It's what? Faith, trust, and obey. Let me read this and see whether you will identify it. When we walk with the Lord, 
in the light of his word, what a glory he shed on our way. While we do his good will, he abide with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Chorus will say, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Simple like that. You will win every battle. Just trust and obey. And then you will see what happens. God doesn't need much from us. All he needs from us is just trust and obey. Now victory is coming. Victory is coming. I was actually thinking of something yesterday. When we were meeting yesterday as a Shuja, uh, that is jo Joshua, Shuja group. In our WhatsApp group, we are 36 members. But in the meeting yesterday, we were less than 10 members, I'm sure. I mean those who are in the Shuja group, right? And then I am like, 36 members, 10 members. But what we discussed yesterday in that meeting I'm sure if we were all of us, we would not even discuss that. When I was sitting there and the discussions were going on, I was reflecting and I said, okay, Gideon brought 32,000 men and God decided to reduce the number and 22 went off. <laughs> anyway, by the way, I am not saying that those who absented from that meeting. <laughs> I see the way the chairman is looking at me here. And he is in our group. So it is like, uh, if I don't say this now, I may go out and be in trouble. <laughs> so, but this is what I want to say. Sometimes, God moves not with the majority. He moves with those who are available at a given time. He used them. Yeah, he used them so well. I was able to actually relate that with what I am sharing today here. Victory is coming. And we are now in chapter 7, verse 19 to 25. Victory through God's power. That is what I see there. So in this section, Gideon and his men are described as using clever and unconventional battle strategies to defend, defeat the Midianite. Maybe like um, David, who used something that you could not even believe to conquer Goliath. So, when Gideon actually took them there, he divided the men and told them that I am going to give instruction. And when I give instruction, you obey the instruction. So at Gideon's signal, they blew what? Trumpet. Smashed their jars and shouted a word for the Lord. And for who? And for Gideon. They are careful here not to say a word for Gideon first, but a word for the Lord and for Gideon. The Lord comes first. And suddenly, I mean this sudden noise, display the light or display of light. And that light creates confusion and fear in the Midianite camp. And I, was, I am thinking here, now, what if now the 22,000 men will hear of this? What if the 9,700 will hear of this? What will happen? Or if there is something in the congregation and you say, no, this thing cannot happen. I don't think it can. And you finally realize that with the strength that God supplies for the congregation, it has happened. 
What will you do? It will not work well, right? And so, Gideon actually also called the surrounding tribes to come and join in the pursuit of the Midianite. And they forced them out and captured two Midianite prince or princes, Oreb and Zip. Those are the names Pastor Emma say theologians need to pronounce. I don't know whether I'm also pronouncing it uh, well. The victory was ultimately credited to who? Yahweh, the God who fight all our battles. There are four themes that I, I am seeing in this chapter 7. The theme of faith, the theme of obedience, the theme of courage, and the theme of God's deliverance in the face of overwhelming odds, when things are not actually okay. For the sake of time, let me tie this to the New Testament a bit. Just as Gideon and his small army who defeated the Midianite with God's help despite being vastly unnumbered, the New Testament often emphasized God's power made manifest in what? In our weakness. Take for, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 to 10, Paul writes about boasting about his weakness so that Christ's power may manifest on, or may rest on him. So if there is anything we can boast of, it should be our weakness so that God's power will be manifest. And no wonder why the songwriters say, I labor on in weakness, rejoicing. For in my need, what happened? His power is displayed. His power is displayed. Gideon's obedience to God's instruction and his faith in God's promises leads to victory. Similarly, faith and obedience are central theme in the New Testament. And more so when you read Hebrews, you hear that happen. Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the substance of things you hope for. The evidence of things you do not even see, but you believe that it is there. You understand? The battles we fight today, we win by what? By faith in the Lord. Also, the story of Gideon reminds us of God's sovereignty and control over all circumstances. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, affirms that God works all things excluding nothing for good to those who love him, demonstrating his ultimate control and sovereignty over events. He works everything that happened. Also, Gideon's battle against the Midianite can be seen as a metaphor for the spiritual warfare that believers face today in the New Testament. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Meaning, even if you have a disagreement with a member of this congregation, you are not fighting against flesh and blood. It is all against spiritual forces. Mark this. And how do you fight those battles? If you go with the Lord into the battle, prayerfully, in the New Testament today, you will win the battle. Because today, even if we must use the battle, the instruction is 
If they slap you on the right, turn the left. So you don't need any battle to fight this, right? You only need faith in God and then prayer to defeat the devil. He comes in so many ways. That is the enemy that we have. The only enemy that we have. But something that I need to emphasize here is that if you don't consider this as a sin, but this is, fear is one of the sins that God actually hates. Fear. Why? When you are afraid, it replaces the trust that you can put in God. Faith and trust can only be seen in a man that doesn't fear anything. Have I not commanded you? Don't be afraid this and that. Don't fear. It happens. God command people. God tell people in scripture, do not fear. Even somewhere he says in the New Testament, do not fear men that can only kill the body. Because they cannot do anything with what? With your soul. But rather fear God that has the power to destroy both the soul and the body in hell fire. If we must leave this church today and go home, what should we take home now? After this, I'm done. As we leave today, I encourage you to trust God's power in your witness and in your challenging times. When you feel like I can't do it, where, do you, where should you run to? Run to God. When you feel like I am weak, go to God. And those who always come to God this way, God will use them. And God will do great things with them. So as you leave this in this week, as you go about things, as things keep getting rough and tough, Trust God. Believe in God. By the way, he knows exactly where he is leading this country to. If Roman says he works all things for good, does it include what is happening in this country? Good. I'm happy. Good. God works all things for the good of those who love him. Does it include those who died, those who've died? Is he working all things through that? In his sovereign power, even before this happened, he already knew those who are going to die. Right? But all we can say to those families, Paul is son. But God knows. Yeah, he knows all these things. That is the way, the, the world you will face tomorrow. So trust God. Believe in God's power. Know that in our weakness, his power will be displayed. And I also want to challenge you to step out always in faith. Obey God's leading and rely on his strength to overcome all the obstacles. Be it those in your office, be it those in your business, be those in your academic line, trust God, obey God's leading, rely on him and his strength to overcome all these things. And lastly, please learn to communicate with God through prayer and also learn to listen to God through his word. God bless you. We can have the music team here even as we come to the end of this service. And we have heard from the word of God that indeed the battle belongs to the Lord. Even the battles that were fought in the Old Testament, they were not of fresh and blood. 
but they were battles that the Lord fought, but he used instruments, used his people. And I want to believe that we will be available to be used of God. It's not by numbers, but it is by faith, by trusting God, and by submitting to him in obedience. And um, uh, we want to go to God in prayer. And I just want you to pray that the Lord may help you to take the praise that you need to take. I don't know what you hear the Lord saying to you this, this morning or this afternoon, but I hope that you'll be able to hear like what uh, he said to Gideon, get up and go down. I don't know whether you'd be, I pray that you'd not be among those who would want to go back home and they would want to go to a place of comfort and a place um, of safety looks like safe, but you would want to arise, take the charge, and go down and face the enemy against the kingdom of darkness. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much even for ministering to us in your word. I want to thank you that you have called all of us. And Lord, we pray that we will not be among the fearful. We will not be among those that will feel like drawing back. But we pray that this day you are going to give us the strength and the courage and the trust in you, knowing that you are faithful and that indeed the battle belongs to you. And I want to thank you, Lord, even in the midst of all the battles that we might be experiencing, even as individuals, we pray that you are going to give us the courage to stand and to go down and face the enemy because you are going with us. We thank you, Lord. And we want to pray for your encouragement upon us as we serve you this particular day and in the days to come. And even as we come to the end of this service, I want to read these words of benediction and pray that they will be words of encouragement to us as we continue to move on and not to draw back, but to continue in the assignment that the Lord has given us. That the victory may be won for us. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, verse 15 and 16. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we have passed on to you, whether by word or mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word and may you go forth uh, in the grace of God the strength that comes from the Lord to serve him um, in this day and in the days to come let's rise up and um, conclude the service as we share in the words of the grace and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore Amen. The Lord bless you and continue to be with you and see you on Sunday. And for the visitors, kindly go down to our Carib launch that we can be able to meet with you and get to interact more. The Lord bless you. When Sweet.
to be 